Olá pessoal, o Lutz Global disponibiliza um vídeo inédito no Brasil com palestra proferida pelo ambientalista José Lutzenberger. O título da palestra foi o modelo liberal consumista perante o desafio ecológico e foi proferida em 1988 na Inglaterra. Na palestra, Lutz apresenta uma crítica moral à ciência e tecnologia, o que ele considerava o primeiro passo necessário na avaliação da situação atual da relação entre humanos e o planeta, visto como Gaia, a partir da hipótese de James Lovelock e Lynn Margulis. Seu discurso vai tocar na insustentabilidade da moderna sociedade industrial, alicerçada no consumo, que era como Lutz gostava de chamar o sistema econômico capitalista. Em suas palavras, abre aspas, a moderna sociedade industrial lançou-se numa carreira totalmente suicida. Estamos derrubando, envenenando, destruindo todos os sistemas vivos do planeta. Não podemos prosseguir nessa corrida por muito tempo ainda. Eu tenho dois recados sobre o vídeo. Primeiro, eu queria agradecer a jornalista Lilian Dreyer por ter cedido esse vídeo para o Lutz Global, que nos vem em DVD mas ele também é fruto do trabalho de degravação da Vidicom, que foi então gravado esse vídeo em VHS, depois convertido em DVD, e agora nós aqui do Lutz Global conseguimos converter em MP4. O segundo recado é o que eu peço a compreensão de vocês, porque justamente como ele foi gravado em VHS, os primeiros dois minutos do vídeo tem alguns chuviscos, tá? Então, assim, peço a compreensão, a paciência porque vale muito a pena a gente conhecer essa mensagem do Lutz, né, essa, por meio dessa palestra proferida em 1988. Tá? Então, assim, uh, vejam que as inovações tecnológicas nos permitem colocar essa preciosidade no ar aqui no YouTube, né, gratuitamente para vocês todos apreciarem. Então, só peço um pouquinho de paciência, porque vai ter uns chuviscos ali no início. Né? E por fim, eu gostaria de lembrar, né, pessoal, se vocês gostaram do vídeo, por favor, deixem a sua curtida, deixem um comentário para a gente, o que, que vocês acharam, né, e não se esqueçam, né, se inscrevam no canal também, tá certo? Agora vamos então à vinheta e ao vídeo, e até a próxima! Mr. Chairman, Morris Goldsmith, my dear friends, ladies and gentlemen. I'm really very happy to be here with you today. And I must say, I consider it a great honor to have been invited to this talk today. In fact, I was here in this tent last year. And I heard a very significant talk by a very brilliant and charismatic men, the Right Reverend uh, Bishop of Durham, uh, Dr. Jenkins. So I hope I can live up to the occasion. Yesterday, I flew, in from Ber I flew into London from Berlin, where I attended a citizens' counter-conference to the World Bank and IMF conference. All over the world, thousands if not millions, maybe millions today, of environmentalists, of people who care for life on this planet, are very seriously concerned about the uh, development policies that are promoted by these international multilateral institutions. You may not know that much of your tax money is being used for tremendous devastation and social disruption in the so-called third world. Four weeks ago, I was in Rondonia, that is in eastern, uh, sorry, in western Amazonia, with a Canadian TV crew filming the devastation of the forest. I had been in Rondonia many times in the last 10 years, and you may have seen some of the films that we made with Central Independent Television in London, Mr. Adrian Carr. 
Last year, 1987, satellite surveys showed a total of 210,000 square kilometers of forest fires in Brazilian Amazonia alone. That is almost the size of the UK. What we saw this year is so bad, it defies description. All of South America was under a single veil of smoke. Smoke was so bad that in my hometown, 3,000 kilometers south of the Amazon, for days, on cloudless days, the sky was gray and the sun disappeared two hours before sunset, turning red and weak. In La Paz, the capital of Bolivia, 3,000 meters up in the Andes, the airport was closed several times for lack of visibility from the smoke of the forest fires all over Amazonia and south of Amazonia too in the Brazilian savannah. If the present rate of growth in the rate of destruction continues, then next year we will probably have an area the size of France, more than 400,000 square kilometers of forest <coughs> destroyed. At the rate things are going, by the year 2000, not much will be left, and we will all be feeling very serious effects. You will be paying again for this destruction, this time not from your pocket, but with your hides because of the inevitable climatic disruptions that will come. But what's happening in Brazil, in Africa, in Indonesia, Malaysia, Indochina, and so on, and even in Australia, <coughs> in the last wilderness, is, is not unique. It's just as bad here in Europe, or in other countries that call themselves first work. In Canada, the temperate rainforests on the Pacific coast, and not only in Canada, on the Pacific coast of continental US and Alaska, destruction of primeval forests, really majestic forests with trees, some of which are 150 meters tall, and between 1,500 and 2,500 years old. Destruction, the rate of destruction there, of clear cutting, most of it imagine for pulp mills, for cellulose factories, is so bad that in the next 15 years there will be no primeval stents left except in a few parks that are dark. But here in Europe too, if you go to Central Europe, to Germany, to West to East Germany, to Czechoslovakia and Poland, the forests are dying of acid rain. And so are the forests in Northern Canada, in Nova Scotia, in New Brunswick, in Labrador. The North Sea, as you all know, is dying. Yesterday, flying over the channel, fortunately, there was a hole in the clouds and we could see the sea. From 12,000 meters up, I saw something that, unless it was an optical illusion, uh, really scared me. The, the ocean was green. It was eutrophic, so things are really bad. In Germany, a recent study showed that practically all the groundwater is contaminated, either with nitrates from agriculture or poisons from industry. And you all are aware of the scandal of ships carrying poisonous loads from one place to another. I suspect that what we see there is only the tip of the iceberg. I'm quite sure that most boats do not try to dump their stuff in some third world country. They simply go to the middle South Atlantic and dump it there. Nobody even knows what's happening. I remember almost 20 years ago, a Finnish professor denounced to the world that a Finnish boat 
was leaving a Finnish port, going into the South Atlantic for exactly that purpose, to dump in the middle of the ocean very serious toxic wastes. This became known only because the professor denounced it to the world. And how many boats go without it being known by anybody? So modern industrial society has embarked on a course that is totally suicidal. We are demolishing, poisoning, destroying all life systems on the planet. We cannot continue on this course for very long. But why are we doing it? Why? If we want to know why, and if we want to do something about it, we must first of all look at the basic philosophy of our present civilization. Why are we doing the things we are doing? It is because of the basic dogmas, of the basic uh, premises, of the basic postulates on which our economic activity today is based. It is really a fundamentally a philosophical, a religious, not a technical problem. The prevailing attitude is that uh, all we need is a few technical fixes, such as controlling pollution here and making a somewhat healthier agriculture somewhere else, and that then all our problems will be solved, but we can go on as usual. No, this is not so. Either we change our philosophies, or we will really finish off life on this planet. Our Judeo-Christian past has given us a worldview that is in total opposition to the laws of life. We have an anthropocentric worldview. We think that we are the only species on this planet that matters the only species that has a right to decide what to do with this planet. When a Brazilian technocrat sees a large tract of rainforest and thinks that he can make some money out of growing, breeding cattle there, he feels absolutely nothing about destroying 100,000 hectares of forest, burning it all, and sowing grass for cows. He has no qualms, no conscience problems concerning the incredible destruction that he wrought by cutting down and burning the forest. This is because our anthropocentric view has given us a limited and exclusive ethic. When we are still traditional believers, Christians, Jews are Muslims. They all come from that worldview that had as its basic dogma the concept of a transcendental a creator outside and above nature, man in a level between God and creation. When we are still traditional believers, our ethic is limited to human relations and relations between humans and God. But relations between humans and nature are not included. It is not a sin for us to destroy a whole forest. It may be a mistake, a technical mistake. It may be unwise to do it, but it's not a sin within the prevailing philosophy. Now, if we call ourselves atheists, agnostics, or rationalists, it's a little worse. Then only human relations count. Again, nature is out. And if we belong to a now fortunately vanishing breed of people who call themselves Marxist, Leninist, Stalinists, Stalinist, it's, it's still worse, much, much worse. Then we can exclude the great majority of mankind. All those people that we call class enemies can, quite, can be killed without but even 
among ourselves doing wars when we fight each other for petty reasons. We consider the other side also outside of our ethics freely. So we are really suffering of a very limited exclusivist ethic. And this ethic, I'm referring to the ethic of modern a consumer society is not only it has an inverted scale of virtues while traditional religions and political ideologies a stressed sacrifice for the common good restraint thrift frugality and so on today we have glorification of waste, of hedonism. If I waste a lot of things, then I'm a better citizen than if I live a frugal life. The more I destroy, the more waste I produce, the more materials I take from the ore to the dump, the better, the more productive citizen I am because the more I contribute to the gross national product, the more I keep the economy going. So it is an inverted scale of virtues. I don't remember where I read it, and I cannot remember the name, but a Buddhist philosopher faced with our way of looking at the world exclaimed, I can never understand a culture where making love is a sin, but cutting down a 500-year-old tree is not. Well, the first part is a little different today, but it still is not a sin for us to cut down even a 2,000-year-old tree. Only a few months ago, I had an argument in Canada with a Canadian forester. When I said that it was sacrilege, blasphemy, to cut down a 2,400-year-old tree with a diameter almost 10 yards to make pulp, he laughed at me. He said, but you've never seen what comes afterwards. These old trees are not productive. They produce only so many tons a year. But the new growth that we plant in its place makes so much more, makes five times more. We need all that cellulose. In fact, they were cutting down those monuments to chip them and ship them to Japan, to make paper. But I would say that that Canadian forest, it was quite consistent. He was only thinking within the prevailing philosophy. We look at nature today. When I say we, I mean modern uh, consumer society. We look at nature and we see only uh, a big heap of resources that are there to be used at our pleasure, at our whim, for whatever we want to do with it, that must be used in the most efficient way we can, that is, as fast as possible. Modern industrial society thinks of itself as being very pragmatic. We don't realize that most of what we do is ideological. In fact, we are not an ideological movement. I would say modern consumer society is a religion. It is a fanatic religion. It is a messianic movement. It is very much like, in the past, Christianity and Islam, a fanatic religion that thinks it has to conquer the whole world. It has to convert everybody down to the last island in the Pacific. It is a messianic movement with a, mess with a missionary 
force, a missionary fervor, with a force of conviction, with rewards to its priests, the like of which never existed in the past. When this messianic movement comes in touch with still surviving cultures that are different, these are immediately doomed. They either collapse or become totally demoralized. When we, so-called civilized people, get in touch with an Indian tribe that is still living in its primeval way, still abiding by its wisdom, maybe 20, 30,000 years old, the minute we touch them, it's the end of that culture. When they see our technology, they feel totally demoralized. They immediately doubt all their values, even though they were good values for tens of thousands of years. And this is happening all over the planet today. Whereas these messianic movements affected parts of the planet, this present messianic movement has taken over the last planet and it is now in the process of swallowing the few remaining islands of cultures still different. In fact, we divide the word into developed and, well, we don't dare say underdeveloped countries. That would be offensive. We say developed pain because it is logical that they want to develop. We cannot even accept the idea that uh, an Indian still walking naked in the forest uh, would want to continue like that. Even the uh, agency in Brazil, the government agency that says it is there to protect the Indian, they always say, but we have to integrate the Indian into our modern world. We have to make it out of him, too. The basic dogma of this uh, new fanatic religion is that we have the key to The key to salvation is technology. The Buddhists, the animists like the Indians in the rainforest, thought the world was perfect. If I'm convinced that the world is perfect, then of course I want to harmonize with it. I want to integrate. I want to leave it as it is. And I want to feel integrated, happy with it. The Jews, on the other hand, were looking for the promised land, but the promised land was here on this planet and it was supposed to be perfect. But then the Christians somehow had the notion that the world was bad, that the world was only a place where you, so to say, pass an exam, where you have to behave correctly in order to go to heaven, and if you don't behave correctly, you go to hell. But the world was intrinsically bad, and you had to work towards life after death. With modern industrial society, it is a little different. Modern industrial society looks at the world and thinks it's imperfect, but it has to be improved. And this is what we're doing. We cannot leave it as it is. When we see something such as the majestic rainforest. Oh, this is where the forest is still intact. This is backward. We must do something about it. We cannot leave it that way. It's totally underdeveloped. We must bring progress to it. Roads and bridges and airports and so on. But even in regions that are highly developed, take West Germany, the policy of the federal government there is that some areas when they have, especially the regions close to the border with East Germany, when they have only a, f a few percent less in gross national product, oh, they're considered backwards. You, we must invest money there to make them progress too, to reach the same level of progress. And we measure what we call progress 
actually only by flow of money. So when a Brazilian says, oh, we have a gross national product of $2,000 per capita per year, look at the Americans, they are above $10,000, the Germans and the Germans and the Swedes have close to $14,000. How backward we are, what a long way we have to go. But the Indian had a gross national product zero. He didn't even use money. And he was a very, very happy person as long as we left him in peace. Now, the Americans and the Germans, with that enormous uh, average gross national product, 25% of them die of cancer, uh, a very high percentage dies of heart ailments, and, and out of every 10 persons, three or four uh, have a psychiatrist, something that would never occur to an Indian. <laughs> a technology has become, if not our God, at least our instrument of salvation, our cross in the Christian double sense of that word. But what is technology? We must clear up confusion. Today, technology and science, by most people, are seen as synonyms. When you open up a magazine such as Scientific American, or other scientific magazines, or when you look at the, the, the departments in news magazines such as Time and Newsweek and so on, where it says science, usually what you read is very little science. In the minds of most people, science and technology are synonyms, and the powers want us to confuse them. They tell us that science has nothing to do with values. That science is emotionally cold. And if we believe that, and believe that technology and science are practically identical, then technology too is unrelated to ethics, morals, has nothing, should not be emotional. In fact, when, let's say, a housewife protests against the nuclear power station, the inevitable reaction by the technocrats is, oh, she's being emotional. And what does she know about physics, about nuclear power? These are highly technical issues that should be discussed in, within uh, highly technical groups of highly technical People, experts who know what they're saying, she has no right to protest. In fact, she has, yes, and very much so, even though she knows nothing about nuclear power. Because her life and the life of her children is being affected. And technology is not neutral at all, neutral at all, as you will see. In fact, there is nothing, or let's put it another way. Many of the people who today are beginning to question what is happening in modern consumer society, for instance, let's wait a little. <laughs> Among the technology, yes. <laughs> for instance, among ecologists, environmentalists, the hippies, or in a completely different direction, people who call themselves New Age, it's very often the case that people reject science altogether because equating science with technology and seeing the harms that modern technology is uh, causing, they, so to say, reject the baby with the bath. But I would say there's nothing wrong with science. But true science, but science as such. But there is very, very much wrong with the way we use science today, and especially with the way we very often prostitute science. 
Now, what is science? Science is not, as most people seem to think, a simple accumulation of knowledge, of information, of hardware. Science is a discipline. It is a method. It is a way of carrying on a dialogue with the universe. I'll give you an image. The true scientist, as I would define him in philosophical terms, of course, you will immediately see that this is a very, very rare person indeed, because the great majority of the people who today call themselves scientists are not really scientists. They are technicians who are developing tools, tools uh, for themselves or for their bosses. The true scientist uh, it could be compared in some ways to a medieval monk or nun. The medieval monk uh, based his life on an act of faith, the faith in his church, whether Christian or Buddhist or whatever, and accepted a virtuous, disciplined life, such as he accepted the virtues of poverty, of obedience, chastity, saying so many prayers a day, and so on. Well, the true scientist is somewhat like that. He or she also starts from an act of faith. Very few, very few people realize that science is based on an act of faith, on a postulate for which there is no proof. But if we do not accept it, we cannot make science. What is the act of faith of science? Science thinks that the universe is rational. There are no miracles. We are convinced that the universe is not chaotic, that it behaves according to very strict laws. Laws that are universal, that are immutable, and untransgressible. Our juridical laws are neither universal, they change from one place to another, they are not immutable, we change them all the time, and we also transgress them all the time. But the laws of are universal. At least that is the main dogma of modern science. When a modern astronomist looking at a small speck of light in the sky sees in his spectroscope that there is a very large shift <coughs> of the lines of that particular light to its red and interprets that as a Doppler effect and then reaches the conclusion that what he sees is a galaxy or a quasar so many billions of light years away from us, then he is presupposing that the laws of physics are the same up there as they are here. But he can never prove that because we cannot go there. But if we do not accept that dogma, we cannot make science. On the other hand, our laws are always transgressed. The laws of nature cannot be transgressed. The river will never flow uphill. If ever it did, then we would be in a different universe. So science, starting from this act of faith, the faith in the rationality and beauty of the universe, accepts a virtuous life, too. To be a true scientist, you must accept a series of of virtues. First of all, you must carry on a clean, absolutely honest dialogue with the universe. A scientist who lies, who cheats, per definition, ceases to be a scientist. 
at least on that issue where he is lying or cheating. Nobody needs to throw him out of any club. He is not a scientist to the extent that he is not being honest. So you see, this is uh, not cold at all. It's an ethical decision. It's very emotional. Since when is science cold? Science is a value in itself. How can you say that science has nothing to do with values, which is the common wisdom today? So a scientist must carry on a clean dialogue with the universe. How does he do? How does he go about doing that? Well, he uses the so-called scientific method, which consists in observing the world around us. And then, either by reasoning or by intuition, are coming to the conclusion that things work in such and such a way. So we set up a hypothesis. The hypothesis, or later theory, is never final truth. It is only an instrument. It is, so to say, the language we use to talk to the universe. When we have a hypothesis, we can test nature. So our hypothesis must be such that it can be either confirmed or refuted. A hypothesis that turns out to be wrong is also a good instrument, because to the extent that we can show that it is wrong, we know that there's nothing to be looked for in that direction. We have to go in another direction. That's also progress. What we cannot use in science is the kind of statements that cannot be proved nor disproved. If somebody were to tell us now what he saw in this room here uh, 50 years from now, we could never prove to him that uh, he was lying. <laughs> but uh, he could also never prove to us that he really saw this place 50 years from now. Uh, unfortunately, some people like this kind of statement, especially among uh, mystics. This is often the case. Of course, we as laymen could then say, well, these people have uh, special antennas that we don't have, and we should perhaps be very humble. But if only in agreement, but they're not. So science really is the only way we have of ringing confirmable knowledge from nature knowledge that we can test. I'm not saying that science gives us all the answers. Actually, the second most important virtue of a true science should be skepticism, total skepticism, especially for himself. A true scientist must always be ready to give up his most cherished notions and beliefs the minute Nature gives him an answer that disproves his ideas. So he must be a very humble, modest person. And when real great scientists, people like Einstein, to cite just one, they were very, very humble people, not at all arrogant. So science is very possible if you accept certain virtues. It is a highly emotional activity. You have to be a very humble, modest person to be a good scientist. The attitude of science is contemplative. I would define science as the contemplation of the divine beauty of the universe. True scientists are not only trying to discover how the universe works. They want to see beauty. They know the universe is beautiful. So, as you see, it is highly emotional. It is certainly not cold, devoid of values and so on. But then what is technology? Technology takes the information the knowledge that science has wrought from the universe and makes instruments to 
tools to carry out somebody's will could be the inventor himself or his boss. So technology is always political. It's also not cold. I'm not saying it's bad. It can be good or bad. Depending on what you're doing, on whom you hurt, on whom you benefit, on what you're enhancing or destroying. But, so, but technology is certainly not cold. It is very political. So what we need today is what I would call a political critique of technology. If technology continues to be based on our present limited, exclusive ethic, then it can become totally destructive. And this is what's happening today. As long as we look at the planet and see only a heap of resources that are there for our immediate use, then we will not stop demolishing the planet. Because in the heads of those who do what I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, who are now demolishing the rainforest, in their heads, what's happening there is a good thing. So the world is not being destroyed by bandits, by bad people. If that were the case, it would be relatively easy to solve the problem. We would need more police. But that's not the case. Most of the damage caused today is caused by good people with good intentions. But they are acting within a certain paradigm, within a certain worldview. And as long as they stick to that worldview, with a good conscience, they will demolish the planet. So we must change our worldview. We must learn to look at the world as something quite different from just a heap of resources. The world is a living organism. Some of you, I hope the majority of you, have heard references to the Gaia concept. Gaia is the name of the Greek goddess of the Earth. And here in the UK, you have a scientist, Mr. James Lovelock, who together with an American biologist, actually a microbiologist, uh, Mrs. Uh, uh, Lynn Margulis, proposed the idea, the concept, that the Earth is actually a living organism. I'm not going into detail now, because that would require another talk. But the Earth is a living organism. And we humans, as individuals, are only as cells in the tissues of this superorganism. A tissue that, unfortunately, today is a cancer. But maybe it can still be cured. So instead of being a cancer on the planet, we must learn to become a functional organ in it. But th this requires a completely different technology from what we have today. Not necessarily different in its uh, technical aspects, but different in its aims. Today, almost all the technology that you see, for instance, what I saw on the expressway today, that flow of cars, Almost all the technology that is today researched, proposed, and imposed is technology conceived by the powerful in their interests. For instance, planned obsolescence, making different but not necessarily better models of cars every year, one-way uh, containers throw away products, all that. This is not conceived in the interest of the consumer. This kind of thing was not conceived to satisfy true human needs. It is conceived by the powerful to concentrate power for them. When instead of setting up hundreds of thousands of small, locally owned and locally controlled power stations, whether water, or wind, or solar, or whatever, we build those gigantic dams, which now in Brazil are being built with your tax money, such as Tucurui, that flooded 2,000 hectares of pristine uh, forest, eliminated, yes, because it was genocide, 
two Indian tribes displaced tens of thousands of rubber tappers. This is not conceived in the interest of satisfying human needs. It is conceived in the interests of the concentration of power and money in the hands of our bureaucrats and technocrats. So this is what's meant by hard technology. We need a completely different type of technology. To give you just one example of where even using the same techniques, a technology can be hard or soft, depending on its aim. Uh, take a pocket computer. Today we have those marvelous little computers that can do things that 20 years ago would have been completely unconceivable. Well, the little pocket computer is highly sophisticated technology, tremendously sophisticated, but it is soft technology. The pocket computer was conceived, so to say, as an extension of an individual's mind. It makes it possible for me to easily do calculations or even reasonings in some kind, in some cases, that I could not do as easily without that machine. So I often wonder what would the world be like today, suppose Copernicus, Kepler, Newton, Galileo had had access to these little marvels. It may have been, I don't know whether it really would have been a, a good thing. They would have had perhaps too much time for other things, perhaps mischievous things. <laughs> but when you look now at a data bank, a big central data bank, it is made with exactly the same chip, same logic, electronic logic. But the aim of the data bank is to concentrate power. Now we must ask ourselves, what would the world be like if this kind of technology had been available to a Hitler or a Stalin. I wonder whether we still would have much democracy left on this planet. So you see, the same technology can be hard or soft. I'm not saying that we have to give up technology. The same technology can be hard or soft, depending not on whether it is sophisticated or not, it depends on the aim it's in. It depends on the aims of that technology. I can give you an example of a very simple, primitive technology that can be soft in one place and hard in another. Take a biogas digester. Here in the UK, for a, German, for a British farmer, for a German, a French, a, a Dutch farmer, uh, a biogas digester would be soft technology. It makes it possible for him to uh, not have to buy uh, chemical fertilizers, it will give crops, and he will have uh, additional energy. And the whole thing could be very cheap, could be built with his own plumber and mason. Now, if I put the same biogas digester, if I set it up in an Indian village that is so poor that people have to use cow manure, for cooking because it's the only fuel available, then inevitably that biogas digester will be in the hands of the most powerful person in that village and he will use all the, the cow dung for himself and the poor people will now not even have cow dung for cooking. So this is very important. We must analyze the technologies that we use, especially the new technologies that come about, look at them and ask ourselves, who conceived them? For what purpose? Whom are they benefiting? And whom will they harm? And how do they integrate into the environment? Only when we learn to give up that limited, exclusive ethic and look at the world in a holistic view, with an inclusive ethic that sees us humans as only one species among dozens of millions of species, where everyone, even the, the smallest bacteria, is important for the well-being of the whole organism. Then, if we build on what I would like to call a Gaian ethic, then can we have a highly technical world 
that is sustainable, that will enhance life instead of demolishing life. Perhaps we should go back to two great men in our own culture, St. Francis of Assisi and more Albert Schweitzer, who proposed a completely different ethic but were not listened to. Albert Schweitzer uh, spent his life looking for a new fundamental principle for ethics. And he came up with what he called the fundamental principle of reverence for life in all its forms and all its manifestations. And that includes even down to the bacteria. If we learn to look at the world with this kind of ethics, then we will develop a type of technology that is sustainable. In fact, we need, yes, what you are practicing here at Scott Body, common ownership, but not just common ownership of one company, of one unit of production. We need common ownership of the planet. But beyond humanity, common ownership of the planet by all the living beings that are part of the big superorganism. Thank you very much.